This is Thursday, August 8th, 2013. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Sheila Bulgarian. Welcome, Sheila. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? September 2nd, 1961. And where were you born? I was born in Methuen, Massachusetts. And where, uh, where do you live now? I live in Natick. Marital status? I'm married. And do you have children? I have two children. Uh, I understand before the interview you mentioned you were just born in Methuen, but you were raised in Franklin. Yes. Tell us what Franklin was like growing up. Uh, Franklin was um, a small town at that point. Um, it had a large Italian population, so I had a lot of friends that were Italian. I grew up on a country road, kind of on the border of Franklin and Medway. Mm -hmm and um, it was kind of far from everything else. I went to Franklin High School. Mm -hmm. um, I worked at Rico's Supermarket in high school and Rentham State School. Mm -hmm. um, so I grew up with my brother and two sisters and my mother and father. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I went to UMass from there. Oh. Okay, uh, UMass Amherst? Yes. And what was your major at UMass? Environmental Science. I understand you went to Regis College before that. That's true. I did. Yes. I went to Regis College for one year, mm -hmm. um, but then I couldn't afford it anymore. Oh. So that's when I transferred and joined the National Guard, where you could get your tuition waived if you went to a state university. Mm -hmm. And my brother had just joined the Navy. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I was originally thinking I was going to join the Navy. Uh -huh. And uh, what's your brother's name? Um, Joseph Ryan. Now you're going to the National Guard, you joined the National Guard at UMass, very interesting time. It's just after the end of the Vietnam War. Yeah. Uh, did you uh, feel comfortable joining the National Guard? I did. I think um, there was some of that feeling at UMass against ROTC. I, I experienced a few little um, ex uh, things while I was taking the bus in mm -hmm. my uniform. Um, somebody put their leg up in front of me so I couldn't walk by and called me a baby killer. Um, mm -hmm. But that was really the only um, bad experience. Most of, and I was majoring in environmental science, mm -hmm. so there was a lot of um, alternative type of people that I, were f I was friends with and I thought that was kind of a good thing. I could um, help them form new opinions about people in the military, I think. I kind of felt like that. Mm -hmm. And you got out of UMass what year? I graduated in 1984. 84 with a bachelor's in environmental science. Yep, and, but I was commissioned in 1983 as a mm -hmm. second lieutenant. So I was still in the guard for a year as a lieutenant before I left for mm -hmm. my officer basic course in active duty. And that was part of your commitment to the National Guard? Um, yes. Okay. And where was officer basic? Um, it was in, at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And tell us what that was like. Different from here. <laughs> very, um, I loved Fort Sill. I didn't care for a lot in Oklahoma very much, but I did like the post. Mm -hmm. It was very dry, um, very flat, except for there was these small mountains. That I would not really even call them mountains. Mm -hmm. um, one of them was Mount Scott. And that was kind of the, um, the reference point whenever we mm -hmm. were firing artillery uh, was the top of Mount Scott. There was a lot of surveying done in that area mm -hmm. because of the field artillery school. Um, I was the only woman in my officer basic course. He was, I was a field artillery officer, which um, there weren't that many of us. What made you uh, choose field artillery? Well, I didn't really choose it. It chose you. I was in, when I signed up for the National Guard, they were looking for a woman to be in the target acquisition battery 
part of the 26th Division Artillery, 26th Infantry Division Artillery. And those were the, the only jobs that women could have in the artillery were in the target acquisition and um, Lance missiles, Pershing missiles, and Massachusetts had a target acquisition battery. And so I was a platoon leader mm -hmm. for a, it was called a sound and flash platoon. It's um, a technology that they don't really use anymore in the artillery. Mm -hmm. It was called sound ranging where you, it was kind of a counter battery thing where they set up a microphone base and based on the sound of the enemy artillery, they could f um, f where it, and this is not a very good technical <laughs> explanation, but it was a whole base along a, a long area, mm -hmm. and they would detect the sound of the enemy artillery and, ex and kind of figure out where it was so that we could send those as target targets mm -hmm. to our artillery. Uh -huh. And how long were you in Officer Basic? I was in Officer Basic from June of 1984, actually July of 1984 to December of 1984. And what happened after that? I decided to go on active duty, so I did not come back to Massachusetts. What made you decide to go to active duty? I didn't know what else I was going to do at that time and mm -hmm. I really was enjoying it and I, there was some opportunities um, to go and go to language school, mm -hmm. go to, I just liked the life. I thought I mm -hmm. would, I, I was really enjoying myself in the Army and um, doing well in the course. Um, and that was the first time I ever got like some sort of big paycheck, like, it wasn't really that big, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't really know what I was going to do mm -hmm. after that. I had ideas that I might go to law school or something like that, but I decided to, to, to go on active duty. All right, so you're still a second lieutenant? Yes. And you had training as a field artillery officer? Yes. You just mentioned language school. How did that pop up? Well, in the, um, in the Army they have in Germany, they had a, a unit called the 59th Ordnance Brigade, and the 59th Ordnance Brigade had units that were custodial units for nuclear warheads, mm -hmm. and we would work with the host nation, they called them the host nation, and they had the weapons delivery system, the Lance mm -hmm. system, or the 8-inch artillery, or 155 artillery system, and we would work with them, and if we ever got a release, we would give them the small nuclear warhead. And mm -hmm. um, so they were looking for officers to, um, to be in the 59th Ordnance Brigade. And so I went to Lance Officer course um, to learn about the Lance. I went to a nuclear um, warhead course, and then went to um, the Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California and learned German. Tell us a little more about each of the programs you just mentioned. Well, right after my officer basic course, I um, came home. So the first one I went to was the Lance officer course. Mm -hmm. So I went there first. And the, um, I'm sorry, yeah, Lance officer, no, no. That's first good, one I went sorry. to, sorry. That's all right. I, uh, I went to DLI first, to language school in January. Okay, this is the language school. Yes. And I was there for eight months, and it was an intensive course to learn German where you was eight hours a day um, learning German from a native speaker. Mm -hmm. um, it was a nice place to be to learn German. It was in Monterey, it was lovely. Mm -hmm. um, it's a place called the Presidio. I lived a block up from Cannery Row in a little studio apartment. Mm -hmm. um, most of the officers lived off post. Um, everybody, they had every language there. And everybody there was going somewhere else afterwards. Right. Now, uh, in high school, college, did you uh, take any other language? Or? I took Spanish. You took Spanish. So taking another language wasn't, uh, pardon the expression, foreign to you. No. 
No, it was mm -hmm. it was good. I I have a good ear for languages, mm -hmm. and um, um, so it was kind of easy for me. And, and so everybody there, they had I don't know 121 languages and dialects that mm -hmm. they were teaching, serv people from all the services, um, the whole Department of Defense. And one of the things that was funny about this, one day everybody had to go and get their wisdom teeth out. Because it, we, everybody was going overseas somewhere. And so they were very concerned that all these young people would need to get their wisdom teeth out in some foreign country that may not, they may not be able to do it. So there was a, a huge line. It was like a little get your wisdom teeth out like factory. So I got three of them out there. That's one of the things I remember, but. Okay, so eight months gets you still, are you still in 1984 now? Or? Nope, we're in 1985. You're now in 1985. And I left there in August 1985, okay. and then I went back to Fort Sill for the Lance Officer course, which was a four-week course. Mm -hmm. Might have been longer four-week course mm -hmm. and um, so we learned all about the Lance um, missile system. Now the Lance at that point was starting to um, not really go away but there weren't a lot of Lance units in the United States. Mm -hmm. There was one at Fort Sill and there was one um, in Germany. So um, you learned about the Lance missile system. There was also a two-week nuclear warhead course there was also that time in between there where you had to apply for a, a top secret security clearance and get all that since you were working with nuclear weapons. Um, and I don't really remember much about the course. Mm -hmm. I remember learning right. about, you know, the, the weapon system. Um, now, were you still pretty much the only woman or one of the few women taking... There was another woman okay. in the Lance Officer course with me. Mm -hmm. um, so because women could be in the Lance missile systems, anything that was, I don't know, a certain mm -hmm. amount of distance from the front or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, at any point did you uh, ever were made to feel uncomfortable or did, uh, did it at least a sidelong glance and say, what is that? Um, you mean f by the men? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. There was lots of, um, I, I remember in my officer base, this was going back to my officer basic course, when mm -hmm. we were out in our seven-day war, mm -hmm. there was one of the instructors, um, he, um, we were we were with 155 self-propelled howitzers, and he was kind of a, a religious man, mm -hmm. and he was you know, um, he started. I, I had taken my earplugs out to listen mm -hmm. to him talk to me about how women should not be in the artillery and women should not be in the army and they should be on a pedestal and that sort of thing. And he was giving me this kind of. Um, talk mm -hmm. and I had taken my earplugs out to listen to him and at that moment the, um, the howitzer went off right like almost right next to me mm -hmm. so my ears were ringing I just remember I shouldn't have even taken those earplugs out to listen to him um, you know there were some even when I was in the National Guard it was mm -hmm. um, there was it was hard. You had, really had to prove yourself. You really mm -hmm. had to um, be better than average. You couldn't mess up. Right. If you messed up, you were incompetent. You know, if you made a mistake, or if, but if you were too bossy, you were um, yeah, understandable. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or so you had to find a, a, a kind of a way to be, mm -hmm. so that you could. And I was a lieutenant, so there was a lot of men that were, mm -hmm. you know, in my command, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to 1985. You have had eight months of German. You have learned about the Lance Missile System. And there was Nuclear. one more stop. Fort Benning. Fort Benning. I went to Airborne School. I'm sorry? Airborne School. Airborne, okay. 
which was kind of like not related to anywhere I was going, but the, they kind of let you do one of those types of courses usually when you're an uh -huh. officer, like air assault, airborne. Men would go to ranger school, things like that. So that was kind of one of those things that you could you could do. And so um, it was at the end of November, mm -hmm. and I went to airborne school at Fort Benning and yeah. jumped out of a plane five times. <laughs> Hopefully with a parachute. Yes. <laughs> And how long were you at airborne school? That was a three-week school. Okay. Tell us what happened next. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I have to say about airborne school just yeah, go ahead. was uh, <laughs> one of the instructors, one of the sergeants there, was also one of the drill sergeants that I went to basic training. And at airborne school, they really harass you. Mm -hmm. I mean, and he thought he recognized me and he started saying, I know you, I know you. And, and I'd be like, I don't, I, I tried to like mm -hmm. pretend that I didn't know him, but he remembered who I was. And after that I had to, he would just call my name out, not even seeing me to tell me to get down and do push-ups, And that was kind of, <laughs> anyway, so mm -hmm. right after that I went, came home for Christmas. Mm -hmm. And right after Christmas, before New Year's, I flew over to Germany, to Flensburg. And you told me before the interview that Flensburg is in northern Germany. Yep, it's right on the border of Denmark. Mm -hmm. Right in between, it's kind of a, um, it's kind of a peninsula almost. Right. Well, it's not surrounded mm -hmm. on three sides, but they call it the aircraft carrier of Germany because that's where all their, mm -hmm. um, all the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe is all up there. Mm -hmm. um, and this was, I was in the 294th United States Army Artillery Group, which is a battalion level unit. Mm -hmm. And I was part of the 75th U.S. Army Field Artillery Detachment, which is like a battery, only smaller. Mm -hmm. And I was a platoon leader. Mm -hmm. It's not really, a, it wasn't really a platoon, it was... Um, now, were you team leader. Yeah, were you called. a uh, second lieutenant at this point? At this point, point I'm or, I was already a first lieutenant. First lieutenant. Yeah. And what were your duties as a team slash platoon leader? Um, we we would we worked with the um, 650th Rocket Artillery Battalion, a platoon, a battery, a platoon leader in that battery. So um, we had custody of Lance Warheads. Mm -hmm. um, so we also, so it was um, mostly a custodial type of thing. We worked mm -hmm. with the German unit, but we had a, a storage site, a storage facility the, the group had um, out in, um, what was that place? Handewitt. It was called, and it was a big nuclear storage site. And we would, um, we had an ordnance detachment mm -hmm. and a small security, but most of the security uh, outside of that was provided by the Germans um, in the 650th Rocket Artillery Battalion. Mm -hmm. But um, we had officers had duty um, in on the Caserne. Mm -hmm. We had a room; it was like a vault, right? And there was a tactical satellite, and we would have duty every. I don't know, once a week at least, where we would be overnight duty and there was, um, you know, it was mostly a communications kind of thing where you would be getting messages and there was a lot of communication security things. There was a procedure for if we were ever going to release a nuclear warhead to the Germans to fire. Mm -hmm. um, so we had to learn all those procedures, things like that. And we went to the field with the Germans. Mm -hmm. um, um, Yeah, so I had, I had soldiers that, that worked for me, but I also had a lot of duties in regard to the custody of the nuclear weapons, too. Mm -hmm. Were you the only officer who could speak German, or were there others within the unit? There were, um, not in the 75th. Mm -hmm. The um, commander didn't speak German. Um, the woman before me, she spoke German. Um, 
I was the only one in the 75th that could speak German. Mm -hmm. And um, this, this is a story about that. When, mm -hmm. um, when the United States or USERA would come and do a nuclear weapons technical inspection, which was a big deal, we had to show that we could do all these release procedures with the Germans, and the mm -hmm. Germans would have to participate with us. And we would have to brief whoever was inspecting. And Lieutenant Dvorak, who I showed you a picture of earlier, mm -hmm. I had him speak English. And um, so we decided that we were going if, to, if there was Americans inspecting us, we would all speak English. If there were Germans inspecting us, then we would all speak German. And I was the first person, the first one mm -hmm. to speak German when the Germans came and inspected the 650th. And so I got a lot of. Um, kind of recognition or kind of brownie points for mm -hmm. for doing that, right? right. And um, so that's uh, probably why I got to go to Crete when they went to Crete <laughs> because I could speak German. Um, so we'll talk about Crete in a minute. Yeah. Uh, did you get along with the German officers? Um, some of them were difficult. Um, Lieutenant Dvorak and I got along very well. Mm -hmm. he, he used to get teased a lot about. Our relationship, though, it was never anything more than mm -hmm. than friendship. Mm -hmm. um, we were good friends, and uh, we worked really well. And um, some of the other officers did tease him mm -hmm. about me, you know, call, calling my, me his girlfriend and things oh, like dear. that. And um, which didn't um, it was okay though. Yeah. The commander was kind of um, he, he he was kind of a little bit. Um, of a sexist kind of thing. He, mm -hmm. he, it wasn't very nice, his commander. Mm -hmm. But we, um, I mean, but he and I worked together well. And the German general, after mm -hmm. he that came and inspected, was very impressed by my speaking German and talking about what we were doing in German. And mm -hmm. so that kind of just made everything from that point mm -hmm. on go much smoother. In the time you were in, you were still West Germany. Yeah. It's still uh, pretty much the height of the Cold War. Uh, what, were the exercises aimed at the East Germans, the Russians? Um, the exercises um, were mostly aimed at like having nuclear weapons and mm -hmm. someone trying to get them. Right. So the exercises, but the exercise were um, the exercise, the field exercises also were aimed at um, at East Germany. You mm -hmm. know that. Scenario coming across, um, you know, around Grafenvir, and and we would be shooting our missiles to the Soviet Union, <laughs> and mm -hmm. we would go to the field all over Schleswig-Holstein, mm -hmm. and just in people's fields, and um, we would be. I mean, they we had a concern, but all our exercises were done. Uh -huh. um, in, in people's towns, mm -hmm. which was very interesting. Because you would probably be in full uniform. Yes, full uniform, mop gear sometimes, which uh -huh. was, you know, chemical gear, you know, weapons, mm -hmm. um, gas mask, helmets, um, all of this. And um, I remember walking, the, I have two stories that are kind of about this, but. Our American, we would set up in a different place than the Germans would because we were, we were working with them, but we were separate. Mm -hmm. So um, we would often have to walk over and had to walk through this little village and there's a lady outside sweeping her step. Mm -hmm. And this seemed all very perfectly normal to her. And I was thinking, you know, if this was in the United States, this would be like crazy. Right. You know, nobody would tolerate a bunch of people walking around mm -hmm. in their neighborhood with, you know, but I don't know, it just made me think about their experience being an occupied country right. and um, um, just how much different it is from our experiences growing mm -hmm. up. And um, yeah, so, and we would use people's, we would knock on people's doors if we needed to use the bathroom. <laughs> um, and they would let us, oh. they would let us. <laughs> and, um, you know, and then, one time we knocked on the door and the lady says to me, she says, Sind Sie eine Mann oder eine Frau? He, she um. didn't know whether I was a man or a woman. And she was completely taken aback mm -hmm. that I was a woman in uniform because they didn't have women in mm -hmm. there in the military. Um, and um, 
there was this other time when the communications weren't set up. And the German captain who worked with me, he came to our site. He says, you have to come with me. Uh, we have a release. And this was not a real release. This was a, mm -hmm. an exercise release. And I said, well, I don't have any communications. I can't get the message. And he said, come with me. Take your, take your sheet. He knew what, what it is that we would take a message down, a mm -hmm. coded message down. And so he brought me to a phone booth and said, call this number. So I dialed my headquarters number. And they started reading a series of letters, like the code, uh -huh. for the release message that we'd have to go back and read. But we were on a, a landline. On a public phone. And, you know, typically, though, I think that could possibly happen in a real situation before, mm -hmm. you know, before we had all this other stuff that we had. But that could happen. We would be, you know, taking over the phones and things like that. And it was just interesting. Yeah, you just made me think of the scene from Dr. Strangelove. <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> with the phone, with uh, Mandrake on the uh, pay phone. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, that was true. We, and the German phones, you had, had these click, mm -hmm. it was different than here. <laughs> but, so. So how long were you in uh, West Germany? I was there for three and a half years. Mm -hmm. And during that time, were you living off base? Yes. Mm -hmm. I lived in the center of town in Flensburg, a beautiful apartment, mm -hmm. right across from the church. It was like a size that have really high ceilings was like a gallery. Mm -hmm. It was only 500 marks. Which was how much in American money? And when I first got there, it was different from when I left there, but mm -hmm. when I first got there, it was about $230. And it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. But they have, it's interesting, their kitchens are really tiny and the bathrooms are really tiny, but these other rooms were like mm. these big spaces. And it was right across from the church mm -hmm. at the northern end of the market, um, Nordermarkt yeah. it's called. And, um, and it was, it was a great place to live. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of German friends. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I was on duty quite a bit, yeah. but um, I enjoyed the uniqueness of being an American girl or a young mm -hmm. woman there. And the Germans all thought that was great. And mm -hmm. so I had just had a lot of German friends. So, uh -huh. so tell us about Crete. So, this was in 1984. This was mm -hmm. um, in the summer of 1984. Um, about every th three years or two years, the um, German, the Bundeswehr, they would go to practice firing the Lance missile, not a nuclear missile, but mm -hmm. a conventional warhead, go to Crete, and they would usually take um, a, an Ameri one of the American officers with them. And one, uh, the time before that, the commander before me had gone, um, the commander of the 75th had gone, and so this time I, I went, and I was the only woman mm -hmm. on the plane, the only woman going at all, because the Germans didn't have any women. Um, but they were, they were very protective of me, I think, because um, I was only, I don't know, 25, mm -hmm. 26, something like that. and. Um, so it was kind of a, a reward almost to, to go. And um, it all led up to firing the missile, one missile, and they would do some training. Um, they also scheduled in a lot of sightseeing. Mm -hmm. um, and we took a trip to Knossos, which is an um, mm. archaeological ruin. We spent the day going through the Samaria Gorge um, which is like a canyon that ends up on this black mm -hmm. pebble-like beach. Um, and, you know, go around in the Greek area. They had a, a little base there. Mm -hmm. And um, and most of the cab drive, everybody spoke German there. It was very interesting. interesting. Yeah. yeah, it was very interesting. All the Greek people spoke German. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be the case any time I went on vacation when I was over there, too, that like I went to um, more, um, what's it called? Mallorca, mm -hmm. and everybody spoke German. A lot of Germans go on vacation, I ah, guess, so they all mm -hmm. speak German. Um, but Crete was really, it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful. It's just like what you would think of when you think of Greece. Mm. You know, it was beautiful. Three and a half years in West Germany with a trip to Crete to boot. Tell us what happened next. Um, I left Germany. Mm -hmm in July 
1989. Mm -hmm. So that was about three and a half months before the wall came down. Wow. So I think mm -hmm. it was October in 1989, I believe. Um, and I went to my officer advanced course at back to Fort Sill. So there was all kinds of talk about women being, so the Lance missile system went away mm -hmm. right around that time. I had a good friend that was um, a, comp a battery commander in the Lance unit at mm -hmm. Fort Sill and um, so she was leaving, so the Lance was going away. They were, they were instituting the multiple launch rocket system, MLRS. Um, and so there really was not much of a future for me in the artillery, mm -hmm. I was thinking at that point. But I still went to my officer advanced course, um, did all the, the things I needed to do. Um, I had already been promoted to captain. I was promoted mm -hmm. in Germany, um, actually right before I left. I was promoted to captain and um, went to the advanced course. We had, um, I was the only woman there too. Mm -hmm. And they did a little different. They had, they did everything in like small groups. So in my small group was a really interesting group. We had an Israeli lieutenant colonel mm -hmm. in my small group going to the school. A lot of international officers were in the schools that aren't U.S. Mm -hmm. schools. and. Um, I completed that, and but while I was there, I was trying to figure out where I was going to go, and I was calling the branch. They call branch. You call Washington, mm -hmm. you know, and um, the branch headquarters to find out where you're going to go. And it was really problematic because there really wasn't much for me to do. I could stay at Fort Sill, which I didn't want to do. And um, though I liked Fort Sill, I just uh, don't like Oklahoma. Um, so I was talking to the branch um, placement, I forget what they call them, detail guy, I don't know, mm -hmm. I forget what they call them, but, and I, when I called them one day, he said, oh, we have something interesting coming here. It's not an artillery job, but it's a branch immaterial mm -hmm. position at the Natick Research Development Center to command the headquarters company. And I said, I'll take it. So that's how I ended up in Natick. The labs. Yep. So I ended up here. I was um, the headquarters detachment, headquarters company commander. Sorry. Um, when I got there, so pretty much all the officers stationed there, mm -hmm. administratively, were part of the headquarters company um, on base. So all the military army people, part of the um, the headquarters company. So that included the commander, mm -hmm. the, um, any of the people working in some of the staff directorates, um, and also test subjects, um, mm -hmm. soldiers who were there to be test subjects. Um, and that was, that was good. So at first, when I first came back, I was still, I was with my mother at my mother's house for a while, and then yeah. I got some housing mm -hmm. um, in Needham. Mm -hmm. And they had a, like a, a little housing area, and I think they still do, up in East Militia Heights Road, up by, yep. um, by Babson. Yeah. Uh -huh. And um, so, <clears throat> I I did that for like a year and a half, and then I went to um, what's called Cast Cube. Cast Cube. Cast Cubed. Oh, Cast Combined Cube. Combined Arms. Okay service staff school or something like that. So this mm -hmm. is where you learn to become um, mm -hmm. a battalion staff person or any kind of staff. So it's kind of what you need to do before you become a major. I see. So uh, that was at Fort Leavenworth. So that was 10 weeks at Fort Leavenworth. And this brings us to around 1990, 91? This is mm -hmm. right, um, 90, Two. Okay. So I was I went to Leavenworth pretty much for the summer. Mm -hmm. And when I got back to Natick, I was still stationed at Natick Labs. Yeah. So I when I got back, I was part of the um 
Gee, no, I don't remember what they call it. It was called the Soldier Requirements Group. Mm -hmm. And so what they had was they had um, officers who were the liaison between Natick Labs, the development of products and things that they mm -hmm. were doing, f and, and the military schools, their, um, their requirements, what they needed. So I worked with the, actually the Marines, mm -hmm. the Aviation School, the Field Artillery School, mm -hmm. and the Armor School. So they all had, they would submit requirements for, they need a new flight vest or they need, mm -hmm. um, so whatever they were developing at Natick to support the different, um, the different um, branch right. mm -hmm. schools. And um, that was really a good job. Mm. Um, I was kind of like, I call it kind of like a front man between right. someone who was military and could, could understand what the engineers and researchers were talking about and kind of translate that for the mm -hmm. for the soldiers. <laughs> I see, like a liaison. Right. right. So it was okay. a liaison. Mm -hmm. And I think they did call our little group, that the, the group was large, but the military officers, there were four of us, we were called the liaison group. Mm -hmm. And um, so then, um, <clears throat> yeah, so I was in the liaison group. Um, I traveled a lot, mm -hmm. traveled to Fort Rucker, traveled to Quantico, um, Fort Sill, ended up going to Fort Sill quite a bit, um, Fort Knox. Mm -hmm. um, so we would, they would be part of Department of Defense, like if the Department of Defense would have sort of a, a conference, if they would have a conference, they would have the Armor Conference every year. and and. Um, Contractors mostly mm -hmm. would go and show all their stuff with with the tanks and the new things that they were developing, and we would also go too as part of Natick mm -hmm. Ardini Center, and we would set up a like a booth and talk about all the things that they're doing at Natick to support mm -hmm. the Armor Corps. So I did a lot of that, um, and I did that for aviation, the aviation conference. I went to Dallas. I went to uh, a whole bunch of different conferences for all those. Um, schools that I worked with, mm -hmm. and it was quite a bit of traveling. And um, then in 1993, mm -hmm. they were trying to cut back. Well, it, during that time also, we had the first Gulf War. So before that, mm -hmm. we had Panama, uh, first Gulf War, um, so people from Natick were going uh, over there too. That's when we came up with the boots, the, mm -hmm. the tan boots, tan you know, the boots. one with the, the desert boots uh -huh. and the desert uniform. So now you see all the time. They didn't have those. Really. I mean, they had a few of them, but things had. This was the big shift from you know, Cold War, um, you know, the European Soviet mm -hmm. scenario right. to small scale. Um, you know, low intensity conflict kind of things mm -hmm. in cities and in, and in, in the Arab countries and things like that. So, mm -hmm. so, and so I was there for so the development of a lot of those um, things that they developed for the desert. Mm -hmm. And um, then um, after the first Gulf War, they were starting to kind of um, they were asking people to leave. So um, they were offering incentives to leave. So in 1993, mm -hmm. I left active duty under one of those incentives and went back into the Guard. What happened then? <laughs> I was a public affairs officer in the Guard from that point on. Um, so, as I said before, that at that point there was no more 26th Infantry Division. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of changes within the Guard, mm. but they had, um, so I was in the Public Affairs Detachment, which is called a PAD, mm -hmm. and Public Affairs was a, um, was like a branch immaterial um, job that any officer could do. You go to public affairs school mm -hmm. and now you're not in the artillery really anymore. Even mm -hmm. though you still are an artillery officer, 
you're not doing artillery, you're doing. Uh -huh. So I was in the public affairs detachment, and then they later, um, they developed the public affairs operations center, which is kind of a battalion, not really level, it's, well, it's commanded by a lieutenant colonel. I commanded it as a major, because mm -hmm. um, I did not, um, I left before I could be lieutenant colonel. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, so that's, and then I ended up after doing, no, actually first I was in the public affairs detachment, mm -hmm. which was up in Reading, um, at the little Curtis, Camp Curtis Guild. Right. up there. Mm -hmm. And then I went to the headquarters, the National Guard headquarters, and it was in Milford. Mm -hmm. And I commanded the um, the headquarters company again. So I had a few headquarters company commands. I had one in Germany too. I, I right. don't think I mentioned that. But um, so at that point I had, head, I was a headquarters detachment commander at the 294th USAG in Germany, mm -hmm. headquarters company commander at Natick. Um, the headquarters company commander at the Massachusetts uh -huh. National Guard, and um, then when they started the Public Affairs Operations Center, I commanded that, and that was up in Danvers. Mm -hmm. that I but we did a lot of interesting things in the, um, mm -hmm. in the public affairs in Massachusetts. A lot of our annual trainings, um, we supported the Winter Olympics in Utah, so we um, did some kind of public affairs mm -hmm. slash security out there where people would come in from Massachusetts, um, reporters and things like that. Right. We would uh -huh. take that we would go around with the reporters. There was mm -hmm. it, this was right after 9/11, um, mm. so there was um, a lot of National Guard units that were activated, uh -huh. and we stayed at an Air Force Reserve place. Um, just north of Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. um, we also, what else did we do? Fort Drum was a place that we went to. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I'm sorry, Camp Curtis Guild. Is that the Cape? Camp Edwards. Camp, uh, yeah. Camp mm -hmm. Edwards at the Cape. Um, Camp Edwards. Um, so I'm just trying to think of if there was another thing that we did. Yeah. I can't think of any more. Well, let's uh, go back a little bit to what were you doing September 11, 2001? I had just, I was working, um, I had been working for, I had been a civilian working for Battelle. It was mm -hmm. a contract, and I was working on a project mm -hmm. at Natick Labs um, called the Mount ACTD. It was a Military Operations and Urban Terrain Advanced Technology, mm -hmm. Advanced Concept Technology Demonstration. And I, um, I had just had my youngest, my youngest son. Mm -hmm. So I left that job in, um, just trying to think of, in November, bef the November before September 11th. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I was still in the guard. Yeah. And um, so I, my full-time job, though, was working at, at Natick Labs for a contractor called Battelle. Yeah. But I left that right after my son was born. Mm -hmm. So, and then um, I was at home with my son, and then I, um, I was looking for work, and I actually started working for the Better Business Bureau. Mm -hmm. And that didn't last very long. But the day that September 11th happened, I was working for the Better Business Bureau, kind of in their media relations right. aspect. And um, so I had a TV in mm -hmm. my office, and um, I was watching the TV in the morning, mm -hmm. you know, to look at the news or whatever. And he sent us all home, and. I'm just trying to think of what we did. I'm just trying to think of what we did after mm. that with the guard. I mean, I was still in the guard. Right. We had some um, exercises in Connecticut. Um, so people were talking about being deployed. There was all kinds of 
that's that what was going on in the guard was you know mm -hmm. you're going to be deployed and so um, in 2003, um, we, there were, you know, everybody in the reserves and the guard was being deployed, mm -hmm. activated for some period of time to go mm -hmm. to Afghanistan or go to Iraq. And um, my husband was kind of like, you know, it's been 22 years. Um, if you go, I don't think I can do it. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, I think it might be time for you to consider retiring. <laughs> So, um, that's what happened. Yeah. So I stayed in for another two years in the Public Affairs Operations Center at, mm -hmm. from 2001 to 2003, and then, then I retired. With the rank of major? Major. Mm -hmm. And what are you doing these days? I'm a teacher. How'd you get to be a teacher? Um, well, both my parents were teachers. I mm -hmm. um, kind of always wanted to be a teacher, but my, my father kind of discouraged it, I think. But um, he, um, while I was, after I, while I was working at the Better Business Bureau, after mm -hmm. I stopped working there, um, I, start, I had already gone, when I was at Natick Labs, when mm -hmm. I was stationed there, I had taken a couple courses at Framingham State, mm -hmm. so I started. I had started to think about that a lot earlier, but right. um, I never really followed through with it until after I after my youngest son was born, and um, I started taking courses at Framingham, and then I started to I took the tests, and I got my master's degree at mm -hmm. Leslie, in um, science education, and. Um, started teaching in Needham actually is where I started. I taught there for two years mm -hmm. and then I came to Natick and, and teach eighth grade earth science at Wilson. How would you been liking that? <laughs> oh I enjoy it, I love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. After uh, you retired did you join any service organizations? No, I didn't. Mm -hmm. I, um, I don't know. I felt, I really did miss it, mm -hmm. you know, but I felt like, um, so it was just part of my identity for so long, you mm -hmm. know, being in the military. I, I don't know. I just had to completely um, detach, I think, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's just to get over it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you still uh, do you attend any reunions with your old unit, or at least keep in touch? Um, no, there are um, a few people that I keep in touch with from Natick Labs, but mm -hmm. um, and of course, this is in the last couple of years. I've started to think about the you know the two ninety fourth has a Facebook page, mm. and you know, starting to think about maybe getting in touch with some people that were there. I had there's one friend that I have um, who she was a commander of the battery, the Lance battery at mm -hmm. Fort Sill. She was also in Germany when um, I was there. She was in a different artillery group. I met right. her at language school. She was taking um, French. Mm -hmm. She worked with the Belgians, but it was in Germany. Mm. She worked with a Belgian unit, and we met at, at um, some of the exercises, some of the NATO exercises that we participated mm -hmm. in. And so, and we we known each other since language school. and. Um, she had a tough time in, in when she was leaving the service at, at Fort Sill. Um, she had this great bat, uh, battalion commander who, mm -hmm. who she was really sharp. She was um, mm -hmm. this um, terrific African-American, great athlete, um, smart, and just a great leader. And she had the battalion commander that was great, and, mm -hmm. and she loved working for him. And then mm -hmm. he retired, and this new guy came in. And, oh dear. and he did not want any women in there. Mm -hmm. And it was, she started being accused of all kinds of things that weren't true, and it was awful. And mm -hmm. she left Fort Sill, um, and then I believe she eventually left the military. I had already gone. Mm -hmm. And I've been trying to find her for mm -hmm. like 
the last, I don't know, 13 years. Really? Wow. And I can't find her. Mm. I, I just have to pay somebody or something <laughs> to do that. <laughs> but she might be on Facebook, but I don't know if she changed her name or, mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, there's been some attempts, I guess, to, uh -huh. to um, locate people who are important to me, but mm -hmm. um, really most of the ties have not been kept up. Yeah. So you were in the military during a very interesting transitional point where women were getting into the branches of the service, including the Army. What do you think now of, my goodness, women may actually be going into combat? I have always thought that it was silly that they couldn't be in combat. I've always mm -hmm. thought, um, I mean, it was not really the women's, I think, there are some women who give women in the military a bad name. Mm -hmm. I do think that. There are some, but there are lots of women who are um, competent, and I think now men are starting to be more, you know, less concerned with those kinds of mm -hmm. things, and they realize it's just another person mm -hmm. in the unit. And I really think that my experience, I experienced both kinds of men, men who didn't want me there, and men who I was just like another one of the guys almost, but mm. um, and and I think that women who can do the job should be able to do the job, right? Um, and I, I don't know. I I've always had trouble with not being allowed to go to like not that I would really want to, mm -hmm. but not being allowed to go to Ranger School. I just thought that was so cool. I would love mm -hmm. to do that, but. Um, you know, kind of a romanticism of mm -hmm. something of it, but um, you know, but women weren't allowed to do any of those things. Right. Couldn't be in the infantry or the armor. Um, being in the artillery, which was also a combat arms branch, it was the only combat arms branch mm -hmm. besides aviation, well aviation as well, women could be in. And so I was really kind of unique, so people would be like, when I went to one of those conferences I was telling you about, Oh, you're an artillery officer? I didn't think women were in the artillery, you know, and, well, we are. I mean, there's not that many of us, but right. we are, and mm -hmm. see, we can do it. Um, not that I commanded uh, an artillery, you know, a, a, a real artillery battery, you know, it was a warhead detachment and headquarters detachments. Mm -hmm. I never had a weapon system that I commanded, but I had my friend Brenda, she did. Right. She commanded a lance battery, and she was real good at it, and... Um, you know, I just think that um, it was terrible that the way that she had got kind of thrown out, I guess. Mm. And now, now she would be fine. She would be in there. And, right. Um, How important was it for you to serve in the military? Um, I'm really proud of my service. I, that's one of the most important things that I've done, I think. Um, I mean, I, I didn't um, fight in any combat situations. I was here at Natick Labs in the first Gulf War, and, mm -hmm. and um, we did some things um, at Natick Labs that helped support soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, I'm proud of that. Um, the Cold War um, was it's certainly really interesting and in mm -hmm. trying to keep that, um, I don't know. Yeah. What about all the technological advancement that took place while you were in the service and just after? I mean, it seems that uh, military continues to astound us, even with the, the textiles. Um, well, when I first went to Germany, actually, when I first went to the artillery school, mm -hmm. they had now they would teach us manual gunnery, which is we call it charts and darts, mm -hmm. and you know, you slide rules pins on paper and you compute target data that way mm -hmm. at a fire direction center. So um, the officers didn't do that, but we had, to, we had to know how to do it because the specialists would be computing the firing data. That, um, and so just when I got there at the end, they came up with this thing called the battery computer system. So this was um, a computer and it was so clunky it was, um, and this was a computer that, that, that calculated all the firing data, and you sent it to a gun display unit 
it electronically transmit. Now it's way, even way better than that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it was just crazy. It, like this was so, oh my God, we got this computer mm -hmm. calculating. But I have to say those early computers, the guys with the charts and darts could do it faster. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, they couldn't get every gun on one point. Uh -huh which the computer can do, but they got like a, and the, typically the way the artillery was fired, it was like a, you know, like a row, you right. know. Um, and um, then when I went to Germany, um, the only computer in the place was this Wang computer in, oh. the, in, in, the, in the operations mm -hmm. um, staff section where, you know, they didn't really use computers. It was not, I don't know, we typed. Mm -hmm. I mean, we typed orders and things mm -hmm. like that. We and made manuals that were typed. I remember redoing some of the Comsec books and trying the training books and trying to get that all organized. And that was kind of the thing that um, got me some notice there too. Was um, and somebody gave me this advice when I first got there. He said, "Become an expert in one thing," mm -hmm. and then you know. So I became an expert in the process which with, with which we. Um, um, uh, of releasing the weapons mm -hmm. to the nuclear warheads to the Germans. It was all kinds of, you know, it was very, it was, it was top secret and, and it was all <laughs> kinds of things and I'm sure it's, it's uh, but it was all, you know, and you had to keep track of all those papers and all the, all the cards and all the things that mm -hmm. had in, in, in safes that had two locks and I mean, okay. it was all, all those procedures I kind of became an expert in. Mm -hmm. But we still didn't have any computers for any of that mm. stuff. And then when I came to Natick Labs, they, we started using the computers um, really in the headquarters attachment. I just had like an administrative computer. That was it one. Mm -hmm. But once I was in the liaison division, mm -hmm. um, we all had our own PC. Right. Mm -hmm. And we were using WordPerfect and mm -hmm. Lotus Notes and sending emails and um, and even when I worked in the Mount ACTD, now that's where I really saw. The Mount ACTD was a, was a um, program where not everything was developed at Natick Labs. They were looking at everything out there to meet a need, like anything that somebody, a civilian would have developed mm -hmm. or um, and evaluating it. So it was more of like an evaluation program where they took, okay, we need this survivability thing. So all these people would get these robots. And mm. I mean, it was just, um, it was interesting. So they were looking at, and even some simple things like textiles and um, materials for uh, helmets. I mean, it's just amazing all mm. the things that they've done. Mm -hmm. But I used to test uniforms too while I was there. Wow. Yeah, so. Uh, test uniforms like for fire retardancy? No, Is just, um, I would just wear them. Uh -huh. I would test them for like wearing, like I would, I they would have developed it and they say, okay, you need to wear this and tell us what you think, mm -hmm. you know, or wear these boots, tell us what you think, wear them around. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So it, was, it wasn't really one of those tests where soldiers, they did have those kinds of tests where tests where soldiers would have to run and mm -hmm. on, on treadmills and be subjected to certain altitudes mm -hmm. and heat and things like that and with different uniforms and food yeah. and things like that. But just here, wear it. Yeah. See what you think. See what tell us what you think. Okay. Yeah. Sheila, anything else? Um, I can't think of anything. Okay. Well, Sheila Bergeri, and we thank you so much for taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. You're welcome. Okay.